Now, this is the first time a, let's call it a country of the global south or the third world, has not merely challenged the United States, but is getting out of the trap that the United States puts everybody in. It, China can't stop the USA's decline. It can contribute to the solution by giving an example that hopefully American people will start to follow. There's a tendency now for Chinese opinion makers to become quite disrespectful of Western policymakers because they're beginning to fear that everything that is being said is just designed to, to, to confuse and, and to essentially to make things more difficult for China. And Graham Allison had debates with Chinese scholars, and he comes over as a person who's very sincerely interested in avoiding war, which is good, which is what Chinese people want to do. But I became concerned that it was taken seriously in China, perhaps even more so concerned that it was taken seriously in the United States of America, because what he essentially argues is that war between China and America is inevitable. That's not merely a pessimistic message, but I think it's a very dangerous message, because if you think war is inevitable, then all you can do is fight it. There's no alternative peaceful way. But second, it has the effect, because of the reasoning he offers, of putting the blame on China for the tension. But in, in a subtle way, many anti-Chinese commentators in the West say that we don't like China because China has done something which we judge as morally wrong. Now, there's a lot of questions you can ask about the moral standard of a nation that was built on slavery. But anyway, they, they seem to think that they have the right to... Um, to judge what everybody else does. But Graham Allison doesn't say that China's doing anything wrong. What he says is the problem is that China is growing. So almost, and I think this is the reason for the interest of, 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 Western, of Chinese scholars, he says the problem is China is doing too well, that China's rise is a threat to America's world position. And he makes a historical analogy, and this is where Thucydides comes in. He talks about ancient Greece in the 5th century before, before Christ, which is 2,500 years ago. And he says there was a very famous war called the Peloponnesian War. And this war was fought on Greek territory. Now, in fact, I'm going to suggest that that's the first historical error he makes. It wasn't fought on Greek territory. It was fought in the Mediterranean. But this was because the dominant power in, in, in Greece was, was Sparta. And Athens was a rising power. It wasn't as strong as Sparta, but it became quite wealthy quite rapidly. And this was perceived as a threat by Sparta. Now, the famous historian that everybody refers to when they want to talk about what happened in that war is a man called Thucydides. And Thucydides was, he's, many people think of him, at least in the West, as the father of modern history. He's the first person to actually record, attempt to record historical facts as accurately as he could to give a narrative which wasn't just a story, wasn't just like Homer, who, who is, is wonderful to read, but um, is essentially just saying, you know, this, this is the legend. He's saying, I'm attempting to ascertain what really happened. And he was himself a general, so he was involved in the war. So a lot of the incidents he was talking about, he knew because he was there. Thucydides is, is very widely trusted as a source. He had a history of the Peloponnesian War. He makes one remark where he says, once Athens began to rise, war between Athens and Sparta was inevitable. Then he makes an analogy. He says, everywhere you get a dominant power and there is a rising power, there will be a great power conflict between the rising power and the um, previously dominant power. Therefore, he then extrapolates and says, China and the USA are like Athens and Sparta. Now, I'm very concerned because particularly finding this was taken very seriously by a number of, uh, of Chinese scholars. And it's first of all, it's not true, even if you forget the, the history. If you just look at the causes of the China-US conflict, it's, it's, it's just demonstrably not true. The reason is not China's rise. The reason is America's decline. Okay, that's the first reason. And nothing China can do can stop 
America's decline, except persuade America to become more like China, in which case it will succeed and stop worrying about declining. But they resist the idea of becoming like China, and therefore they carry on declining. And that decline is the real cause of the growing gap between China and the USA. You see, if you say Sparta equals the United States of America, and Athens equals China, then you're saying this is a battle between uh, a slave run state that used to put its children out to die on the hills and only kept the ones who survived because they were going to be warriors. That's the USA (laughs) by this analogy. And Athens, the the center of world democracy, is China. So that's a little bit of a problem for the USA. Um, But the second problem is that it wasn't Athens's rise that provoked the dispute. It was when Athens converted itself into an empire. And the historical record on that is very clear. Athens was a, was a naval power. It was not a land power. And you only have to look at the role that ships play in Athenian history. Or I will just show you the map of the Athenian Empire. So that's Athens. Now, this is Greece on the left, this little block here. Sparta is down the bottom here. Athens is, you can see, it's on the east coast. And Athens' allies, or its colonies, as they called, these, these little black dots, went all around the Aegean Sea, including all the way up to the Black Sea, incidentally, all along the coast of what is now Turkey, but was then Persia. It was a Mediterranean power, and it was attempting to set up a Mediterranean empire. And the key moment in the war, which is when Athens started to lose, is when the rulers of Athens converted this green arc here, they converted it from a defensive league against Persia, not against Turkey, against Persia over here, who came became a big land power in only 50 years before the war broke out, and that was then the big threat. They converted that into an empire, and they, they went on a disastrous military ex- expedition to, to, to conquer Sicily, and they failed. And the leader of that expedition, Alcibiades, then deserted to the Persians. Well, nothing like that has occurred in modern history. It's a completely different sequence of events. And the cause was Athens converting itself into an empire. So if there's any lesson to be drawn from this, it would be that under no circumstances convert yourself into an empire. That, that would be to me the lesson that China, which I think is drawing from it. I don't think there's any, I don't see any indication China has any aspirations to become an empire, quite apart from anything else that can see what happens by looking at the USA if you try to do that. Um, so the historical analogy is wrong and the current analogy is wrong. So it's not true in terms of today's events, but it's also not true in terms of the real causes of the war between Athens and Sparta. And it's not true that every time you have a rising power that threatens a dominant power, the dominant power fights with the rising power. And a very classic example, uh, there are many, and there are many from Chinese history. Chinese historians have pointed out that there are many incidents in the rise of the history of China where this simply does not apply, that the dominant power doesn't say, oh, you know, we're going to fight you. They say, hmm, that's quite interesting. Maybe, maybe we can learn something for you. Maybe we can work together, have a bit of a battle and then sort things out or whatever, right? There's a very famous political military leader called Philip, Philip of Macedon, and his son was Alexander. And that was a territory to the north of of Athens. And Alexander, as we know, was victorious against the Persians, actually crushed the Persians, created an enormous world-spanning empire. It was always in indirect contact by the con- kingdoms and, and polities that came between. But, but but Alexander essentially you know, reached India and came in direct contact, opened up the trade routes. It's sort of predecessor of the Belt Silk, Silk Road. You can read many debates in Athens about what to do about Philip. And there's a debate, and the debate had a majority in favour of saying, well, Philip's quite a good thing for us. He will create stability and we'll not have to worry about fighting all these uh, people like Sparta and so on, because we'll be part of somebody else's empire. So let's do it. And in fact, um, Alison, who wrote the book about the Thucydides trap, he cites many examples in which 
countries did go to war with each other because of um, great power rivalry caused by the rise of a new power. And there's a lot of a lot of theory around that world world systems theory, for example, about the succession of hegemons and so on, which I think is very suspect. But anyway, most interesting is all Alison's examples start from the dawn of capitalism. There are 1500 years between ancient Greece and the examples he's citing. He says nothing about relation, for example, between Rome and Germany or, 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 or Athens and, 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 and Alexander. Uh, so that he's picked something which is specific to an era of history, which is very different from the era of the ancient world. You've, it's, a, it's a big historical era, which is known in history. And Alison, I'm surprised that he doesn't know it, to suppose that simply because something applies under one set of economic and social and historic conditions, it applies under all of them. In fact, I think the causes of the conflicts that he cites are not the inevitable rivalry between great powers, but capitalism. Capitalism is an inherently competitive system. So it's all about getting your share of the wealth, getting your share of colonies and driving the other guys out of those colonies so that you've got the more power. So Columbus, for example, the origin of Columbus and the conquest of America was that the Ottoman Empire dominated Eastern trade. So the capital, the, 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 the rising cities of, of Venice and Genoa, uh, the Mediterranean cities who traded with China could only trade via the Ottomans. And the Ottoman Empire also had big access to sources of gold, which was very important because it was used for trading and silver. So they set out to the West because they wanted to find an alternative route, originally an alternative route to India. So it was motivated by competition from the get-go, from 1492 onwards. Then successive countries rose to dominance. England was perhaps the first, Holland, it's argued, or the Netherlands rather, was you know, perhaps the first uh, seagoing hegemonic power. Then, then England and France rose. Then England became the dominant colonial power. There's no question of it. And they really developed modern capitalism. Then you have rising challenger powers. You have Germany, you have America, all of whom basically were at odds with England and wanted to replace it, either to fight it or to dominate it. So the causes of the conflicts, which Alison traces, are really the rivals, the rivalry between capitalist powers. Now, that is a problem with the United States because it's a capitalist power. So it's inherently competitive. But that's not China's fault. That's, that's America's fault. Now, I'm just going to see if I can share a graph that kind of illustrates the problem. This is a graph of the GDP, that's the gross domestic product, the output, the economic power of the United States. And it starts in 1950 and it goes up till today. You'll see it's has declined continuously, basically since 1950. It has a series of crises which correspond to well-known events. I'll give you an example. You look at 1974, there was a big crash. Growth went down from 6% to 2% and stayed between 2% and 3% for, for a long time. And there was a big economic slump in 1974. It was very famous at the time. It was the first occasion on which there had been a slump of something like the scale of 1929 in the West. Then it recovered. How did it recover? Well, it launched a full on attack on the rest of the world by the policies that we know as neoliberalism. It shot up interest rates. It drove many countries that had been developing quite well, such as, you know, the countries of Latin America, countries, many African countries, drove them into debt and used debt to impose on them policies that basically meant they would become exporters of primary goods, exporters of products of cheap labor and that the West would maintain its technical dominance. And that was very effective. It increased US power growth back up to 4.6%. But look what happened. It crashed right down again to an even lower level before. Next, we get, you know, the overthrow of the Soviet Union. Big gain, big temporary leap forward, crashing the, the Soviet economy, which is true cause of the rise of Putin, because, you know, it was a terrible thing for the for the Russian economy, as, as one of the main architects, Jeffrey Sachs, now admits. Well, immediately after that, it falls again. 
And then there's the um, this is the this is what happens after the the Asian financial crisis when what the US basically did is it got out of a big financial mess by trying to get the uh, Japanese and Koreans to pay for it. Uh, which they did in the so-called reverse plaza accords. Then you have 2008, and it's crashed to a level of something like 0%. And it went up for a bit. And every time it goes up, you get the journalists saying, you know, we're on the recovery road, we're back on the march. But if you look at the way that they describe the figures, the figures don't support the theory. Because the period in which it was supposed to have been doing wonderfully, it was actually expanding at a rate of 2.5%. This is the lowest peak. If you look, if you look at the tops of all these things, they keep going down. So this is the lowest peak in post-war history. So the United States is in historically a very bad position economically. And that's what's driving what it does. Because it has two means of reinforcing its strength. One is which it tried in the 1960s to attack its own working class. So there was a big onslaught on basically American wages and trade union power in the 1960s. And what did you get? 1968, you got the explosion of discontent. You got the intersection of the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, which originated, one should not forget, in the trade union movement. Martin Luther King, who was the most famous spokesperson for the civil rights movement, started off very clearly in the defense of workers' rights, because that's where most people of color in the United States get their living because of the oppressed condition they find themselves in. The attempt to solve it by attacking the working class was catastrophic. It provoked the 1968 rebellion, threw American society into, into enormous difficulties. And every time that the United States attacks its own working class, it runs into significant internal difficulties, sometimes take very right-wing forms, as, for example, Donald Trump, but, but it runs into difficulties. So the other method is you get the rest of the world to pay for your problems. You use your economic clout, which is essentially your technical superiority, to force them to supply you with cheap raw materials products of cheap labor, minerals, agricultural, basic products. That's that's imperialism. That's what imperialism is. And um, this was very well described by an Indian economist in the 1920s, 1924, a man, a greatly neglected thinker called M. N. Roy. And he simply says, look, the rich countries of the world, they didn't call them the West at that time, they just called them the rich countries. They uh, exploit the labor of four-fifths of the world. But the poor countries can only exploit the labor of their own country. So they obviously have an enormous advantage. They've got the whole world working for them, but the whole world doesn't want to work for them. And so you have this um, almost gut reaction that has come out after the war with Russia, the Ukraine-Russia war, where country after country, including countries one would not have expected it if you just judge it from the moral standards of the USA. Countries with quite right-wing governments, authoritarian, repressive governments, Saudi Arabia, India, are saying, no, we're not going along with this. And the recent visit uh, of United States plenipotentiaries to Africa was a complete disaster. That These African leaders that they confronted, who were being told, go along with us and fight Russia, said, no, we're not going to. We, we like working with China. We like working with Russia. It's better than what we got from you. So there's a general atmosphere of revolt amongst that four-fifths of the world who says, we're fed up being, being made into the solution for America's problems. Now, the danger that China presents in this respect is it shows that you don't have to. It shows that you can develop your own economy. Justin Li Fuyin put this very well in a contribution I read in which he calls it the new economic model. New economic, Some people, I'm included, would say that it's actually socialism, um, which is the view of the, the, the Chinese government, and I basically go along with that. that. It's more economically successful, and even the United States. Now, this is a first time a, let's call it a country of the global south or the third world, has not merely challenged the United States, but is getting out of the trap that the United States puts everybody in. It's it's not being, it's not allowing itself to be the exporter of primary goods. It's surpassing the USA in many areas of technology. I don't want to exaggerate because 
true standard of technological achievement is not just how many patents you have, but how well your people are doing. But you see, the policies of China have done enormous amount to eradicate uh, the lowest levels of poverty, and I think will, in time, now probably begin to eliminate the inequality, which is which has grown under the marketization of the Chinese economy. And that's a phenomenal technological achievement. There's no country in the world has raised so many people out of poverty in such a short space of time at all. So this is the real threat that China presents to the USA, is it's not allowing itself to be ground down by the USA. Now, then the question is, what can you do? China can't stop the USA's decline. It can contribute to the solution by giving an example that hopefully American people will start to follow. And I think that's um, a very real possibility and has to be worked towards. But ultimately, the solution lies in the hands of American people uh, and the European people. Um, and the answer consists of saying no to the USA. Can't do it that way. Can't carry on the way you've done. You're going to have to try something else. So this is the sort of main conclusion I came to. Mm -hmm.